Welcome back to The Independent with Scott Atlas. Today I'll continue my conversation with part two of the interview with H.R. McMaster. I think another example I'll move on to is North Korea, because uh, if I'm reading correctly, at the beginning of the Trump administration, there were several uh, tests done by North Korea, and it's this rogue regime, clearly supported 90% plus by China. Uh, so it's a complicated uh, uh, country and a complicated adversary, really. And I think a lot of the media was distorting or ridiculing or somehow minimizing uh, the accomplishment of President Trump in the North Korea and the Korea and therefore North Korea China a relationship as you relate it uh, in the book. And I think one of the I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it, but I want I want to make this a uh, point so I don't forget. And that is that the willingness of President Trump to use force was shown when he bombed the Syrian airfields. And this is relevant to the discussions about North Korea and China and everything else. And you relate the story of when when that actual bombing actually occurred. But go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think this was an important element of of the uh, the, the shift and another another big shift in foreign policy toward you know, away from strategic patience under the Obama administration with North Korea toward uh, toward maximum pressure. And I tell the story. The title of the chapter is uh, you know, a, a well oiled machine. Really. No, because remember, President Trump at one point in 2017, he said, yeah, our White House is like a, a well-oiled machine. Well, you know, at times it really wasn't, or at least the oil was breaking down, you know? Yeah, <laughs> although constant... I'm not sure any any White House is a well-oiled any, machine. No, so. I, no, I write about this in the book, right? This was, the, any of the issues that we encountered were not unprecedented. But, but, the, but the president's national security team really performed well for him, and he performed well in terms of making a tough decision. In the midst of of the preparations and the and the initial day of of the the Xi Jinping visit to Mar-a-Lago, and this was in April of 2017, um, Syria had had conducted a heinous attack using some of the you know the the most horrible weapons on earth against civilians, killed hundreds of people, scores of children, in Khan Shikun, and and uh, and then President Trump decided uh, to conduct a strike against that air base, such that uh, the 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 use of chemical weapons wasn't normalized again after, you know, 100 years after they had been banned at the end of World War I. Um, and also, you know, to restore deterrence against Assad generally in terms of, you know, that that uh, that regime's, you know, effort to commit these kind of serial, serial episodes of mass homicide. Um, and th this goes back, speaking of deterrence, if I may interrupt, to the Obama red line. That's right. It was crossed and nothing was done about it. That's right. President Obama said it would be a red line if, if Syria were to use chemical weapons against civilians and inflict mass casualties. They did that. Uh, Assad did that in 2014. There was no military response. And actually, even worse than that, the Obama administration invited the Russians into Syria to verify the dismantlement of Syria's chemical weapon stocks, which, of course, we know they never did because they kept using chemical weapons. But what that did is it got the Russians back into Syria at a time when the Assad regime was, was on the mat. And, it, and, it, and the Russians got them up off the mat so that they can continue to kill more Syrians and, and keep that civil war going. So, yeah, it was a disastrous policy. President Trump again and reversed. This is an example of President Trump acting, no matter what people want to say about how he talks about Putin, he actually bombed a Russian asset, really, which is the Syrian support of Syrian uh, military. I mean, this is an action, uh, you know, again, like my theme, the way I look at people, frankly, uh, is I judge people on what they do, not what words are cheap. Uh, and, and I want to get back to this. Uh, but you, you have a phrase and a sentence in your book. You said it's easy to think there's no downside to talking. The truth is that it's naive. And, and that's sort of a softer way to say, you know, talk is cheap you know, uh, words are meaningless, but it's also, it, it, it's a, it's a demonstration of naivete. And, uh, when you're dealing with tyrants, when you're dealing with dictators, when you're dealing with enemies, whether it's president Xi or Putin or, uh, in North Korea, 
they're looking for this naive sort of uh, Obama-esque persona. And that that whether Trump has foibles or not is not a question because everyone does. But the question is, what were the actions? Yeah, I think you're right, Scott. You know, the uh, you know our esteemed colleague, mentor here who served as a Hoover senior fellow to the age of 100, George Schultz, he said that he said that negotiation is a euphemism for capitulation unless the, the shadow of power is cast across the bargaining table. And I think a, a lot of times, you know, leaders forget that it's through the integration of elements of national power you can, it, it, it helps you advance your interests. What you hear oftentimes from the Obama administrations is it's one of the, and the Biden, the Biden administration, I mean, it's one of their mantras is, hey, we need more diplomacy. I mean, what does that mean? Actually, we, we need, you know, we certainly do need diplomacy, but it has to be diplomacy that's backed up, you know, by hard power, uh, by economic power, you know, and, and I think sometimes people forget that. The strategic competence is really the ability to integrate all elements of national power and efforts of like-minded partners to overcome obstacles to progress, take advantage of opportunities, and advance American interests. And, and it's, as I think you said in the book, it, it, it's the 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 whole strength of negotiating whether it's with friends and allies or anyone else is based upon not just the capacity to act but the demonstrated willingness to act right because without that and i think this is something that that again is uh undervalued uh about president trump and this comes from being a businessman uh who was known for tough negotiation and I think that when we have presidents, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on how that compares to, you know, we're looking at a, the Biden administration or, or a potential president, Kamala Harris, in the foreign policy arena, which is filled with very tough actors yeah, versus absolutely. President Trump, who has a totally different take on things. Absolutely. And I think the, the, big, the big lesson that we, we should learn from the massive reinvasion of, of um uh, of Ukraine in 2022, is that it's the perception of weakness is provocative. I have a chapter title entitled "Weakness is Provocative," and I think what 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 you see happening, you know, in Europe now uh, with the ons- continued onslaught against Ukraine, is the result of the disastrous self defeat and and deadly and humiliating retreat from Kabul in in August of 2021. Remember, it was around yes. that. It was right around that time that Putin penned that long essay, basically saying, "Hey, Ukraine's not even a thing." It was a couple months later when he started to marshal Russian forces on the border uh, of of Ukraine for the massive reinvasion. And so, I do. I am concerned, you know, about the perception of weakness. I think it's also the perception of weakness, Scott, that led to the October seventh you know, mass murder assault on on. Uh, on Israel, a, percep- a perception of weakness on the part of the United States. Remember, we're having problems even sustaining support for the Ukrainians then. And I think, I think Iran thought, hey, they can't even continue to support the Ukrainians. Maybe it's our time to act against Israel. They saw the difficult relationship between President Biden and President Netanyahu. Uh, they saw the they saw the division within Israel associated with the judicial reform efforts there, and and uh, and the protests and. And so it is that perception of weakness is provocative. That's why, Scott, I'm kind of worried about the next few months, you know. When- right. I, I'm very concerned. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I think let's, I want to talk about a little bit about the, uh, about a couple of things that we've already brought up, but the Afghanistan withdrawal. There, there's a, a, a part in your book where you're talking about uh, what President Trump did. Yes, he wanted to withdraw from Afghanistan. Yes, he's in the in the mode of saying he's not for, quote, endless wars, unquote. Um, But I was impressed with two things. Number one, uh, he listened to you and and he listened to people. And I think this is something, again, he's caricatured a certain way, but I saw it in my own discussions. I was always uh, pleasantly engaged on, he asked the right questions, he listened, he thought about it. Uh, and, and it's viewed as somehow he's just like a bull in a china shop. I, I don't think that was your experience when when he was listening to things. But the bigger specific point about Afghanistan is uh, you mentioned that he increased the force management level uh, to 3,000. He was not for 
as a reader, it seems, just simply withdrawing from Afghanistan. I mean, that that was very different, handled in a very different way by the Biden uh, administration. And this is what Kamala Harris says. She was the last in the room and and very happy with the result of the Afghanistan withdrawal. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So so I you know, in the book, I, I really do give President credit, uh, President Trump uh, full credit uh, for making a tough decision that cut against his predilections in August of 2017 when he put into place, I think, the first reasoned and sustainable approach to the war in Afghanistan and really the support, our support for the Afghans who were continuing to bear the brunt of that fight on a on a modern day frontier between civilization and barbarism, you know, Scott. And but you know, sadly President Trump kind of backed down on that strategy between then and when he sent his envoy, uh, Ambassador Zal Khalilzad, to negotiate with the Taliban, which I think was a big mistake, you know doing that, especially without the Afghan government president. It kind of kneecapped the Afghan government. I mean, heck, Scott, even the Obama administration, when they were going to leave Iraq, they didn't negotiate with al-Qaeda in Iraq, you know? So I think what happened is, you know, he had a lot of people in his ear with the end the endless wars mantra, all those other kind of, you know, formulations about Afghanistan, like graveyard of empires, or, you know, there's no military solution. Well, hey, the Taliban came up with a military solution. So I think no, right. I think, but the execution of the withdrawal the was under Joe Biden. Yeah, so, that's not a President Trump no. withdrawal, am I correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So what I'm about to say is like, you know, it, it, the responsibility is shared across both administrations, but the, the disastrous way that, that the withdrawal was conducted. I mean, Scott, in what world does it make sense to evacuate the military before civilians? I mean, how could that make sense? And then to give up, you know, Bagram Air Base, which was a secure place you could have had a secure quarter, you know, for for refugees and for you know, for or actually those who were who had helped us, uh, as well as civilians from not only the United States but all of our allied uh, countries, and and then you know it was the way that, the way that it was conducted, the the way the Biden administration justified us. They said, well, we had no choice because of President Trump's policies. Well, they reversed every other Trump policy. You know, they stopped securing the border. You know, they you know they they uh, they canceled the Canadian pipeline. And green lighted Nord Stream too. I mean, I could go on and on. You know, with what we talked right. talked about how they reversed his Iran strategy. So, hey, I, I just think responsibility shared, but but obviously it was it was the, the the humiliating nature of that withdrawal, the disaster, the deadly aspect of it. I think that emboldened our adversaries. I'd like to talk a little bit now about uh, Europe, NATO, uh, the Russia Ukraine conflict, and how this all ties in. And also the sort of general topic about alliances, uh, et cetera. Uh, we hear a lot about, uh, you know, first of all, we, we recently heard President Biden brag about how most of the NATO members are paying their, quote, 2 percent without uh, sort of mentioning that that's uh, clearly a direct result of, of President Trump, because uh, in my view, President Trump views things as a negotiation. And things are said to gain the ultimate result, just like in any other negotiation. Uh, but, uh, you know, he there, it's a very complicated relationship. But I, I, one of the things that stands out in this context to me from your book was his discussion with uh, Merkel when he, as you said, presciently, quote unquote, said, you know, there's a very big problem with Europe depending upon Russia for energy, for oil and gas. Uh, and there's not that's not something that is positive toward Russia. The policy that President Trump was saying, which is you got to get out of depending upon Russia. Right. Tell and, me what your and, thoughts and are on that. What he did, though, too, what he did is he sanctioned the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So the Nord Stream 2 pipeline wasn't going to get finished because, you know, it, it, nobody was going to finish it and, and risk U.S. sanctions, right? Not do business with anybody. You know uh, anybody uh, uh, that that, uh, that uses U.S. bank the U.S. banking system and so forth. So, uh, what did the Biden administration do when they came in? They greenlighted Nord Stream two and lifted the sanctions, right? So, so he had this great conversation. This is one of many conversations I relate in the book that is a little bit humorous too. That yeah, I think uh, President President Trump and Chancellor Merkel like they kind of like chiding each other a little bit, you know. And President Trump will say something like, "Hey, Angela, you know, you think if you think." Uh, <laughs> If you think NATO is so fantastic, you know, why are you paying your dues is what he would say <laughs> instead of, you know, like, why are you, 
investing, you know, what you pledge to invest, which is at least the equivalent of two percent of your of your GDP, into into defense. And uh, and then he also said, you know, why why are you buying Russian gas, like and feeding, you know, Putin's ATM? Uh, and then you're asking us to defend you. And then he would he turned to me. I tell a story in the book. He goes, General, you know, how many how many you know how many soldiers do we have in uh, in, in in Europe? And I said, well, thirty five thousand, Mr. President, but plus additional troops that are rotating there as part of the Euro- European deterrence initiative. And they would look back at Chancellor Merkel and say, you know, what, what you know what? So, and he had a point because at that point, of course, at, at, you know, at, at that stage, our rotational troops to Europe were costing the U.S. taxpayer about the equivalent of one third of Germany's defense budget, right? So, so now, you know, if you look at, at what happened, well, after the reinvasion of Ukraine, Nord Stream Two got canceled, and what happened is Germany, you know, uh, Olaf Scholz, the you know the, uh, the the chancellor, declared a Zeitenwende, you know, and you know a a, a change uh, in in time, uh, and 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 is now you know investing more in defense. So so you know right. he was right. As about did that. many, as did many NATO allies. Uh, yeah, that's right. I think it brings up two things again, like results matter in my view, uh, and the results were were good. Uh, but I also think there's something else that you're, you're alluding to and you, and I think you know it yourself is that, uh, you know, people talk a lot about president Trump's and the relationships with people being offensive or whatever they want to say in negative terms. But the reality is one-on-one, I, he's a very engaging guy who has very good, uh, discussions with many, many world leaders, even those that badmouth him to their press. Yeah, no, he 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 did he did have I think productive relationships while I was there. You know there there were some there were some strained relationships we saw toward the end with you know uh, Prime Minister May in the UK and and then you know and then you know uh, Macron and so forth and and but you know hey I mean that that happens but I'll tell you some of the relationships that were I think really quite close and 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 had a, a really important uh, important impact. Uh, I put at the top of the list the, the relationship with Japan and Prime Minister Abe. I mean, they they were really kind of kindred spirits a lot. They both golfed, you know. President Abe, you know, he he knew what President Trump wanted. You know, he wanted what President Trump would tell me. It's my my favorite word. He would say reciprocity, reciprocal, reciprocal. My favorite word. You know it. And and so he knew that uh, that we wanted Japan to to shoulder more of the defense burden. Japan is doubling its defense budget right now. You know, um, right and. And then, and they worked out, you know, a, 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 uh, the uh, the U.S. Japan trade agreement. Ambassador Lighthizer, that guy's fantastic. I mean, the, he was U.S. trade representative. He's extraordinarily competent, really great. Another team, example, team if leader. I if, from your book, if I may, uh, is uh, Poland, and part of it was Poland was uh, suffering from the lack of uh, of of a relationship and support from President Obama. Uh, where you mentioned in the book that Poland uh, w- did not get the anti-ballistic or whatever missile defenses that they were requesting. This is a NATO question. Again, people have this mantra that somehow uh, the president, President Trump, is the one trying to destroy NATO, uh, where actually the actions uh, can be very different for, for allies. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so actually what President Trump did you know, through this, you know, controlling you know, uh, countries to, to pay their dues in his view, which is really investing uh, in, in their in their own defense so that we have a stronger mutual defense, actually did strengthen the alliance. Where, where I would advise President Trump, <laughs> what I advise him not to do is to make statements like, hey, if you don't pay your dues, we're not going to defend you. And and he's, he's gone back to doing that sort of thing, which, of course, you know, from his perspective, as as you mentioned, Scott, it's like a negotiation, right? You say something like that right. to get people to do it, but the problem is it kind of weakens the alliance from a psychological perspective, and could embolden you know an aggressive actor like like Russia. So, you know, I, I read in the book about how hey, he's disruptive. I love that, you know, because there was a lot that needs to be disrupted in Washington. But again, it's just one of these examples of sometimes he gets so disruptive he disrupts his own agenda, you know, because then. The whole conversation, instead of being about, hey, these countries that are not fulfilling the you know, the Wales pledge, this is his pledge of at least two percent of uh, of the G, uh, equivalent uh, of GDP invested in defense. Now it all shifts to like Donald Trump and like his you know his his you know what he's saying 
and and, and viewing it as like bombastic or right. irresponsible. So, but hey, you know, well, part part of this is really though uh, the the press. Uh, you know, I mean, the media is is sort of poisonous, and in in real ways, in my view, uh, is harmful. To, no, to the country. What, this is a big part of the at war with ourselves theme, right? And and uh, and I write about how you know the hostility of the majority of the media toward President Trump, as well as the Mueller investigation, which was based on you know the discredited Steele dossier, which had been funded at least in part by the Hillary Clinton campaign. I mean, this created you know this sense that you know I mean President Trump was under attack from like the first day, you know, and and so. That's not good. That's not healthy for our psyche as a as a country, but it's also not healthy from a governing perspective. And that's one of the one of the big themes in the book. And also, you know, Scott, I, I think we've seen many examples of this. President Trump, you know, he is prone to say some things that are offensive, counterproductive, irresponsible at times, right? But a lot of times, whatever he says, it elicits a response that's far worse than anything. That, that he said, you know, on, on the other end of the spectrum. So I just think, you know, I, one of the themes in the book is, hey, let's get over it, man. Can't we just get over it? Talk about what you're suggesting. Let's talk about results. Let's talk right. about and, real policies. I mean. And, and one of the things that's another theme in your book uh, that I at least need to mention, uh, it's not just the media that was uh, intent on undermining Trump and the Trump administration at the at the harm to the country that didn't matter uh, in my view this is my opinion that was not the issue the issue was just how to undermine and attack president trump no matter what the cost but the separate part that i want to bring up is it was even inside his appointed team and i think this is a big a big uh, theme of where I said you were sort of naive, like I was. I think you and I are, are similar in in certain ways, and in one of those ways is, you know, we thought the job was, you know, we're trying to help the country. We assumed that other people were, and that's just not that's just not necessarily true, uh, in the sense that we knew we were advisors, you and I, in different areas. We we weren't uh, in charge. We were the advisors. Uh, the president's elected to be in charge, yet that was not actually how some of the people that you happened to work with in the White House viewed their role. Yeah, I, what I wrote about it, and I was aware of this from you know, from studying the presidency and studying the Lyndon Johnson administration and the lead up to Vietnam, and and this is one of the themes in the book that I, I, I wrote called Dereliction of Duty years ago. There are three types of people in the White House, and I'd love to hear what you think about this, Scott, if you agree with this. Right? I think the first group of people, as you mentioned, are who advisors or those who are are serving the administration, the president, who think that hey, the president should have you know his own agenda, and to help that president uh, determine his own agenda, we will provide best advice, best analysis, and multiple options, right? So the president can determine you know his own foreign policy and national security strategy. The second group of people come into the administration because they have their own agenda, right? They think, hey, here's this is my thing, I want to get done, and I'm going to join the administration to get this done. And then the third group of people are people who define their role as like saving the country or maybe the world from the president. And the problem with that second and third group is, as you alluded to already, hey, nobody elected them. And and if sovereignty lies with the American people uh, and they elected the president, they're actually undermining the, the Constitution, you could say. So I think, you know, this is you know, this sometimes gets caught up in a you know, like a conspiratorial you know kind of thing about deep state. But hey. Actually, bureaucratic inertia exists, and those who, in those other two categories can impede a president's uh, policies. And I was trying my best to, you know, to drive implementation, uh, but met a lot of resistance in, in in driving the implementation of the president's decisions. You know, and you know, I thought, of course, we're we're all hired uh, or asked to help on the basis of expertise, so it's not like you're a blank slate. That isn't the point, but. Uh, the reality, and I and I saw this uh, in in my area, but the reality is, you give your best advice, uh, and and if it's not taken, okay, that it's not taken, and you can either do your best to give your advice, or you can quit, but you can't just do 
what you're told not to do if you have the authority to do something. I personally had no authority whatsoever. You you guys uh, in national security actually had some direct authority. No, I really didn't. It was funny. The job as national security advisor, you know, it's a it's a it's a odd job that way. I mean, I mean, but in terms of impacting policy, where you're talking on behalf of the president or the country yeah. to other people, and you relate a few of these examples where there were people in that world of national security, foreign policy that just took it upon themselves to say what sort of, this is my impression, sort of what they wanted. No, ab- absolutely. So, you know, the, the president wanted, for example, contingency plans for so things you can, antic- you can anticipate, right? And, and there are those who thought, well, if we give, if the president these, these uh, contingencies, then maybe he'll use force capriciously or something, which I, was never my experience with President Trump. Or, you know, even just some quite simple things, Scott, like, hey, Stop giving the Pakistanis aid uh, and military assistance because you know they're providing assistance to our enemies, right? I mean that makes total sense to me, you know. But or it, the Qatari support of terrorism, where he <laughs> turned to Secretary Tillerson and said, in a very abruptly, "Listen, just stop that." I think that was the conversation, right? Uh, right. Because he 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 sort of. Uh, uh, I think the thing I, I uh, can take from working with President Trump is it's not just that he has common sense. He just actually cuts to the chase. Uh, he, he cuts to the quick of the issue and says it what's obvious right. and is determined to do that. Right. And, and and sometimes like he'll say things that, you know, that that most people would consider like outlandish. Right. But you know, he's he's thinking out loud a lot of times. And a lot of times he's he's just challenging conventional wisdom. You know, so in, in you know in other memoirs, people have pointed out uh, uh, you know the comment that he would make be made you know, several times to me. Hey, why don't we just bomb the drug labs in in Mexico? And and so some people are like just appalled by that. Like, the acts of war. Does he have that? Is that does it really fit into you know his Article Two authorities as president to be able to do that? And I would say, no. What he's what he's saying is we need to challenge our assumptions. I mean, sixty thousand yeah. Americans at that time every year were dying of fentanyl, right? And they and it's coming across the border from Mexico. So he's saying, "Hey, this is kind of a war. Like we're you know, we have people dying." And he yeah, wanted... he wants to have the discussion. He wants to, right. like you say, challenge assumptions. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, uh, I I think he's 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 correct in his impatience and disdain for past failures. Yeah. Uh, repeated failures of politicians who talk and don't act or who talk a big game. Uh, but carry a very weak stick. Yeah, well, and this is like, this is, the, you know, like he would just, a lot of times, you know, as you know, go off on the stupid people. So we call them, you know, and start. And Which start, I happen to think he's right and about. And start read, ready about it. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, yep. Listen, uh, I want to conclude with just sort of a, your general assessment as, as a, you know, what do you say to people uh, who are concerned about national security and we have suddenly, you know, we we had uh, people worried and warning about if Trump was president, the world's going to go on fire. He's going to embolden Putin. But meantime, under George W. Bush, Putin took Crimea. Under Obama, Putin uh, had uh, Ukraine. Under Biden, P- Putin furthered Ukraine. Under Trump, there wasn't a, a, certainly not an increase. In fact, Trump did a, significant things to keep peace. The Middle East was more peaceful, not less peaceful. And now we're, we're faced with uh, Kamala Harris running for president. And, and I just wonder what your thoughts are on what you would anticipate, uh, given that we spent, you know, $175 billion on Ukraine. The estimate of the United States is that almost 500,000 people are dead. These are real people that are dead. Uh, and, uh, I just wonder about world peace and, uh, ending wars rather than starting them under a Harris administration with what we've seen under Biden versus under what we saw in Trump's record. This is a comparison of records here. Well, you know, in in terms of, in, in terms of the Ukraine war, uh, again, weakness is provocative. And I think it was that perception of weakness that led to the war in Ukraine, the belief that that the United States, our European allies, would not support the Ukrainians. I believe that, you know, I, I you know I'm a big fan of G.K. Chesterton, Scott. You know, who said that war is not the best way of settling differences, 
but it's the only way to ensure they're not settled for you. That's a situation that the Ukrainians are in. And I think that what President Trump should do is pull off you know, the, all the restrictions on the amount of support that we're giving the Ukrainians. You mentioned the, you know, the amount of money spent. It's been a very low percentage, actually, uh, of, the, of the equivalent of our defense budget uh, right. that we've provided to the Ukrainians. And, and that money spent in the United States, by the way, you know, because it's spent on U.S. weapons and it's creating U.S. jobs. But but despite all that, I think that the you know the the um, oh you can't you can't you can't, there's not a lot of solace in the five hundred thousand people's families who who have died if if it's true that there are certainly hundreds of thousands. Well, I, I think you blame Vladimir Putin for that, which right? Is what you do and and um, and recognize that that you know he's continuing his onslaught uh, on Ukraine and will continue uh, his onslaught against Ukraine and you know and his subversion of the rest of Europe uh, until he's stopped. And it's Ukrainians who's stopping him now, and who deserve our support. I mean, I, I mean, you know, Scott. I mean, they've been kidnapping children, you know. And and, right. uh, and, and I mean, oh, there's no question there's evil here. Yeah, it's the question is what so. president will be well, effective well, so in I stopping think, yeah, it? Yeah, I, I think that I'm con- I'm concerned about what I hear from elements of the Trump campaign about hey, you can end the, end the war in a day. That's not going to happen. Uh, but I'm also concerned about. You get what I would call like the fecklessness of the Biden administration in terms of a lot of the restrictions that are put on the use of certain weapon systems, as well as, you know, just metering out the assistance little by little and debating and agonizing after over every decision. You know, uh, you know, tanks or no tanks, F-16s or no F-16s, the amount of support and so forth. Right. And what we're seeing, though, Scott, and what I hope that the Trump campaign recognizes is that the fight in Ukraine is connected inexorably to the the fight against Iran in the Middle East and the potential crisis in the Indo-Pacific region. And I think what we're seeing, and this is why whoever gets elected um, in November is going to face a much more dangerous world because we're seeing a coalescing of this axis of aggressors. And and you know, Russia and China uh, have, in, in many ways, you know, I, I mean, become an uh, extremely close alliance. They are, you know, and and uh, and in, in some ways you could say that China is, is fighting, you know, in some regard, a proxy war against the West using the Russians in Ukraine. I mean, they're providing them with all sorts of financial support, material support in the form of the hardware and electronics they need to sustain their war-making machine. You have North right. Korea providing them with the artillery. You have Iran providing them with the drones and, and missile capabilities. What's Russia giving them? Russia's giving them technical expertise for their missile and I think probably their nuclear programs as well. So, you know, what we're seeing is this coalescing of an axis of aggressors who are acting in concert with one another and taking advantage of our preoccupation in one area to accelerate the achievement of their aims in another. And and that's why, you know, we have to be resolute, I think, and and strong again because we, it's the perception of weakness that's provocative, and we we can't afford to have naive foreign policy uh, based on weakness, appeasement, uh, this kind of thing that we've seen historically uh, too much of. Uh, so uh, no easy solutions, but I'll end it there. And thank you, HR, for for spending the time. Uh, it was great pleasure speaking with you. Hey Scott, I always enjoy our conversations. Great to be with you. Great to be your colleague here at at Hoover. Thanks for having me on. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to The Independent with Scott Atlas. If you want to find out more about today's guest, H.R. McMaster, watch his expert commentary on the news and in the media, follow his work at Hoover Institution, and don't forget to subscribe to this show on YouTube as well as Spotify, Apple, Google, or anywhere else you're listening to your podcast right now, and I'll see you next time.